Almighty God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather on this morning. We have come together from many different places, from many different walks of life, yet we come in awe and expectation of what will happen in this place during our time together. 
O oh God, we know that you are here, for you have said where two or more are gathered, there you shall be also. So we ask now that your spirit would so move in this place, that you would open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear, and our hearts that we may truly know and understand all you have to say to us in this place on this beautiful morning. For we offer ourselves in worship in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith with the historic confession, the Apostles' Creed, which can be found printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you have children with you this morning, I hope you'll let them come and spend a few minutes with me. Well, good morning. That's pretty awesome. I'm glad to see some of my friends I hadn't seen in a while. So glad to see you. So glad to always see each of you. So what holiday is next week? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Okay, what's your favorite Thanksgiving food? What, turkey? Turkey. Turkey. You are. That's exciting. That is fantastic. What are some other... That's going to be fun. What are some other favorite Thanksgiving foods? Your grandmother's mashed potatoes. So we've had turkey, mashed potatoes. Anybody? Broccoli? Brussels sprouts? Brussels sprouts? Yeah. See, I'm not a big turkey guy. I'm a ham guy. I love ham. And my mom's, um, my mom's cornbread dressing. You know, whether you're from the south or north, where you call it dressing or stuffing and what goes in it and how it's made. Have you made one of those turducklins? Yes. Our friend from Louisiana. There's turduckins. Ooh. So Thanksgiving's a time when we have good food and we enjoy that and we sit around the table. How many of you still have to sit at the kids' table at the Thanksgiving at your family? You no? Know? Y'all are all at the adult table now? A few kids' table? I like the kids' table. Desserts are better. You're with your cousins. You sit at the kids' table with your cousins. So Thanksgiving's coming, and we're all thankful for food. We're thankful for family. We're thankful for friends. And this is a time of year when we all kind of remember those things for which we're thankful. And I bet y'all are thankful for a lot of other things, too. Uh, On these cold nights, I'm thankful for a a place to sleep. And I certainly remember our friends that might not have uh, that. And we we as a church try to help them. Yes, ma'am. Softly sweet, Julia. So when they see someone who needs a bottle of water on the streets, they've got bottles of water in the car to hand out. 
And there's so many little ways we can help. And the first way is acknowledging what God's done for us and then finding a way to share what God's done with, for us with other people. And I know y'all already do that so many ways. Um, is Miss Faith here this morning? She's not. Faith had told me, some of you weren't here last week when we told that, that our backpacks that we all collected, Miss Connie let us in and helped. And Miss Faith talked about how wonderful, the te- how, how excited the teachers were to receive those gifts and what a difference it made. Because they get a lot of stuff in the summer, but they don't get a lot of stuff further along. And so thank y'all for all you did for that. Will you bow your heads and you pray after me this morning? Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for our many blessings. Help us as we sit around the table to remember others and think of ways we can serve them through your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can head out to Children's Church and go sit with your parents. seated. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, I invite you to find the prayer request list that's located on the back of your bulletin and uh, keep all of those folks in your prayers this morning. Um, And also want to uh, remind you that if there are other prayer concerns or celebrations you'd like to share with us, that there are some prayer request cards located in the pew backs in front of you. You Certainly fill that out, placing an offering plate or uh, hand it to me following the service so that we might be praying for you and with you. Will you, go with, will you join with me now as we go to God in prayer?
Almighty God, as we gather this morning, we are always mindful of the privilege it is to come into this sanctuary for worship and to go forth to live and to serve. As temperatures plummet, oh God, we this week and, and in the week to come, we're particularly mindful of those who have no permanent roof over their head. We pray for those who seek shelter in difficult times, and we pray that you would continue to be with us as we seek to support and share resources with ministries that provide that much-needed help in difficult times. Continue to encourage us in reaching out and lifting up those in need. God, we are mindful of our world this morning. We're mindful of war that rages and disease that ravages. We're also mindful that you call for a true and lasting peace. A peace that begins with each of us loving our neighbors, ourself. Being able to reach across those things which divide us and find ways to be united in love and grace and generosity. God, as we approach this Thanksgiving season, we certainly are mindful of all the many things that you've done for us. We're mindful of the many blessings we enjoy. We give thanks for all that you have created in this place we call Atlanta First United Methodist Church. Oh God, help us to be good stewards of all the many gifts that have been entrusted to us. That we might reach new generations, make a difference in the lives of many more people because of the opportunities that we have in this place, in this great city. God, we give you thanks for our children this morning, for their bright smiles and their energy, their energy which is infectious and, and drives us to be a better church and to be better people, that we might be a model and a witness for them. Oh God, we come now to offer you these prayers and we come offering gifts, your tithes and our offerings. And we ask that you would accept these our prayers and accept these our gifts. For we offer them in the name of Christ who taught us when we gather we should pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Ariel and Hannah. Absolutely beautiful. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew's gospel, the 25th chapter, beginning in the 14th verse. Matthew 25, 14. Out of respect for the reading and hearing of God's word, I invite you to stand as you're able. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then the man went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents, and see, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers, and then on my return I would have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent for him, give it to the one with the ten talents, for to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance, but from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, amen. A couple weeks will be the first Sunday in Advent, and generally in Advent, we we open with John the Baptist, and the first thing that John the Baptist says is, you brood of vipers. Um, You know, most evangelists out there would not think that would be the best way to build a church, to People to walk in and the first thing you do is to call them a brood of vipers. I'm not sure that this text is a whole lot better when the the last verse says that I'm going to throw you out into the outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If we were to put together texts um, that we're going to... We were going to run television uh, commercials or print ads uh, for Christianity and and the message of the Christian faith. I'm not sure that that's where we would start the outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many of us have heard of of the parable of the talents. Uh, We've heard it told many ways, both in in, in sacred context and in secular. And we've heard the well done, good and faithful servant or well done, good and trustworthy slave many, many times. If you were here last week, you know that, and if you've looked through your bulletin this morning, you'll see that there's a pledge card in there and This is primarily for our members, people who have been here many, many years, and for them to contribute to the, or to to pledge their commitment to the ministry and the ministry of the church in 2015. And so last week we talked a little bit about Thanksgiving and and how we respond to that. And and certainly this morning, this is leading up to an opportunity to come to the altar and to leave leave those, those cards at the altar for those who are prepared to do so. But I want to spend just a few minutes talking about this parable and, and talking about the ways people have interpreted it in, in a new way that, that has come to my attention that I've never quite looked at before. Certainly the most basic way that this text has been interpreted and preached throughout the years is um, 
we're all responsible for the talents that God's given us, and we've got to use those talents for our, to our very best ability, and, and we've got to multiply those talents and use them to the glory of God. And that the one guy just didn't get it. Now, here's the problem with that. If, if you have reasonably intelligent people who are listening to you, and I believe I have above reasonably intelligent people, I'm preaching to a, a church full of very intelligent people who are going to quickly ask the question, so who is this landowner or this, this lord, this master? Who is he supposed to be? Because we know that when we read the Bible, often when Jesus tells parables, within these parables, the people represent someone else. So who is this man supposed to be? Well, certainly most people think, well, this man is surely God. Or, and and, and if, you know, if we think about the Trinity, is it God the Father or is it Jesus? I'm not sure there's a whole lot of difference there, although some of the commentaries will debate if we look at the Trinity, whether Jesus is speaking of himself in the parable or, or, or pointing to God the Father. But if you think through that for very long and you think about the fact that everything sounds pretty good until the third man says, I just knew you were a scoundrel. And because I knew you were a scoundrel, I didn't want to cross you. And I knew that because others knew I was your slave, if I went dealing with them, they would know it was your money with which I was dealing and I didn't want to deal with that. So we're, we're stuck wondering, so why is Jesus telling a parable in which God or Jesus is a scoundrel? And do we really want to follow a God who, who sends someone into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth? We have to ask these questions. And those who know me well know that I might not wrap this up with a bow today. I might not have all the answers, but I'm going to ask these questions. Steve Krafchick was one of my professors of New Testament at the Candler School of Theology, and, and, and Steve was, a, I, I enjoyed his class, and one of the things I enjoyed about him is how he would break down the text, and he would ask questions. And one of his favorite things to say was that many Christians know the almost Bible, We've heard the stories so frequently that we hear them and we make assumptions about the text that may or may not be there. For example, again, you can tell this morning that my, my head and heart has already been in Christmas. How many wise men were there? I'm hearing three. It was, well, we don't know. There were three gifts. But if you go back tonight, if you're like me and you can't wait to dig into the Christmas story, if you go read the story, it says they bore gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, but it never identifies how many of them there were. There were a caravan of people traveling, and we've made this assumption that there were three. There's other places in the Bible, the, the rich young ruler, it never tells us how old the ruler is, it just says that he's rich but we assume that he's young. So let's look at the parable of the talents this morning. We've always assumed that this, this man was, this master was evil and, and unscrupulous. But let's read carefully what the text says. It was the third slave who said, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And if it, every English translation you look at, what the master does is ask a question back to him. So you knew that I was a harsh man and that, that I, I, I gathered where I had not sown and that I, I reaped where I had not harvested? He asked the question back to the person. This this picture of this man is not confirmed by the other two slaves. Nor is it confirmed by the person in the story. He simply asks the question back. So you knew this. If you, if you knew this, then why did you behave in this way? So it begs the question. If, if we are to believe that in Matthew's gospel, as Jesus tells his parable, that 
that the master, the man, was to represent God. And we're, we're so quick to kind of place these attributes from the third slave on this man. The question becomes, what is our image of God? What image of God do we have in our heads and our hearts? And it's, it's, center, it's, it's central to who we are as Christians. You know, there, there's, there's a whole segment of our population that, that might see God as this condemning God, this manipulative God, this God who acts harshly against people who don't behave in a certain way. If one has that worldview of God, then, then that's got to be a very difficult relationship to have with God. We've also debunked the, the flip side of that in, in recent weeks when we've talked a little bit about the prosperity gospel and that, that some have the worldview of God. If they, if they give enough, then God is going, to, is going to bestow upon them lavishly all these wonderful, wonderful gifts that somehow God is a vending machine and we pray for something and it comes out the bottom. Fact of the matter is that, 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 that each of us have an image of God. I've, I've told the story many times in my preaching and at least on several occasions uh, to this congregation that one of my mentors in the faith was my great aunt Laura Frances Phillips whom we called Tansy and I remember like it was yesterday standing by the glass louver door in the den at her house asking her what God was. And, and, and who God was. And Tansy said, well, God is a being, B-E-I-N-G. But the little four or five-year-old boy heard bean. And I didn't know if he was a llama bean or a green bean or what kind of bean he was. So I carried this image around for too many years of God is a bean. Each of us have our own images of God, who God is what God means in our lives. And, and, and as Christians, the, the world gets its image of God from the way that we behave. I think it was Gandhi who once said, I like your Christ, but I don't necessarily like your Christians. How is it that we see God? What, what kind of image of God do we carry? We need to know a couple of things about this as well, that, 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 a, that a, a talent is a lot. A, a talent was a lot. You know, sometimes we've, we've talked in one of my other favorite parables of the workers in the vineyard and where they're given a, a, a coin that's a day's wage. That was not a lot. Barely enough to kind of go home and try to scrape to set, gather some things for your family. But a talent is a lot. One of the common commentaries said a super abundance. Not just an abundance, but a super abundance. And, and each of these individuals are given talents relative to their ability to take care of those talents. The fact of the matter is we... We each have gifts and abilities. And, and some of us are better at some things than others. We've talked a lot about that. And some of you are artists and clearly we have incredible talent among us of those who can sing and, and play instruments. Some of you are accountants and lawyers and doctors and each of the things that are represented, each of the vocations that are represented require specific gifts and strengths and skill sets. But we need to make no mistake that a talent is a super abundant. So five talents and two talents and one talent is a lot of money. And we need to also carefully hear these words. After a long time, one of the greatest gifts we have is time. Some of us have a super abundance of time and some of us don't. And I never understood it until the past few years and, and it's cliche, but, but the older we get, the faster time goes. I'm trying to figure out how it's November 16th, 2014. I'm trying to figure out how in a couple weeks is the first Sunday in Advent and that before I'll turn around, we'll be 
singing, ushering in the new year. But the man gave them these talents, and then he went away for a long time. He gave them, he gave them this superabundance of resources and entrusted these resources to these individuals, a superabundance of things. Another commentary said, an absurd amount of wealth. An absurd amount of wealth. And these resources were invested and, 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 and multiplied in two out of three cases. What does this all have to say to us in Atlanta first? One is that this is a, this is a very difficult text. Because even, in, in, even if, if we're willing to, to say this, that, that maybe, just maybe, the third person who buried the treasure, because he's the only one to accuse the master of being harsh, maybe it's his view of the master. Maybe it's a view he and only a few others hold. And and, and when the master says, you will be taken away, maybe that's not necessarily the, the master sending him away, but he's made his own decision and how he looks at other people and interacts with other people, and that, that this outer darkness is just a separation from others. Even if we read it that way, this is still difficult, because I preach and teach all the time that I believe God's love is great enough for all of us, and that God calls all of us to share God's love with the entire world, and that there is no end to God's grace and God's ability to be present with people. But the reality is we have to allow God to be present with us. And we have each been entrusted with an absurd amount of wealth, and and particularly those of us who have had the privilege of coming through the doors at 360 Peachtree Street. Just this week, uh, there was a report that was on the Peachtree Corridor, and, and it was defined as the eight, little over eight miles that stretch on the north from at Lenox and and Phipps to on the south at, at City Hall. And the, the Buckhead CID and the Midtown Alliance and the, and the Downtown Improvement District, they, they funded this study to figure out all of the impact of the Peachtree Corridor. It, it represents like 3.7% of the city's land, but like I think a third of the city's economic output. Tens of thousands of jobs along the Peachtree Corridor. More and more multifamily residential coming all along Peachtree. Pierce Harris used to say at the corner of Peachtree and Porter Place, we've always identified ourselves as being on Peachtree. The average price of an acre of land in that Section, $6.7 million. And that's coming out of a very difficult economic time. I've already said that I've got some very intelligent people in here this morning. I'm going to tell you that Atlanta First United Methodist Church is privileged to be steward over 1.85 acres of land on Peachtree Street. Now, I said average, so before you get too excited multiplying, understand that that's an average, and there are a lot of things that go into the value of something. But what I would say is that that's a super abundance, that that is an absurd amount of resources that we've been entrusted with. To sit at the corner of this place, and and the entire report is predicated around the fact that the millennials who make up about 80 million people in this country are moving more and more into densely populated areas. The next generation are at our doorsteps, and we have been entrusted with a super 
abundance with an absurd amount of resources. So the question for us is what we're going to do with it. Are we going to take it and are we going to invest it? Are we going to invest in it? Are we going to dig a hole at the corner of Peachtree and Ivan Allen and Porter Place and West Peachtree? If you pull up a map of the investment in this area, it, you should know in, uh, from the news of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, the College Football Hall of Fame, Centennial Olympic Park, that the, 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 the investment arm, Invest Atlanta, investment arm of the city has put out for bid the Civic Center property. A little over one acre track of property sold a couple years ago for just under $5 million dollars two blocks away from us. And when you read about that property, it talks about its access to 7585, its visibility from the connector, its access to the Civic Center MARTA station, that it's centrally located. Oh yeah, there's also a $1.2 billion stadium that's going in and half a million people that come to visit the city for one reason and another. So people are living here, they're working here, they're playing here. And if we do our job, they can be praying here. But we have got to find ways to reach the next generation. We've got to find ways to not squander this super abundance, this absurd amount of wealth with which we've been entrusted. You know, they say in real estate, it's location, location, location. Many urban cities and er, er, many, many churches in urban areas are struggling. But we have no reason to struggle. The, the, the churches that are struggling in other urban environments are because those urban environments are struggling and ours is not. More and more people are moving to the city. And we can be here ready and willing and able to serve and to be in fellowship and discipleship with those who come our way. So this morning, for those of us who are prepared to, to make our pledge, we'll come down as, in a few minutes as the choir sings, and, and we'll leave that pledge. And, and what that pledge is, is investing in our future. It, it's, it's a recognition of what God has already done for us. And the question of whether we're gonna bury it in the backyard or if we're going to find a way to leverage it in way. Listen, I'm talking about, let me, let me tell you this story, and I will end on this. We had a little break-in earlier this week in the basement. Doors that weren't very secure. Someone got in. They, they didn't get further than the basement. So this morning about 5.30, uh, the phone rang, and it was, it was our security company. And... and um, one of our front doors that we just repaired is we're, we've got all the new hardware back on there, but somehow, some way, one of those doors had cracked open, and one of our neighbors from across the street had called the police, and the police had tracked me down. And so at 5.30, I threw on some jeans and a, and a fleece, and I, I came down and met a wonderful city of Atlanta police officer, and, and it, 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 we think the door probably just kind of snuck open. Everything was fine, everything was in place, nothing was scattered. But we had, to, we had to come into the building to just walk around and make sure, particularly because of the break-in last week. And I stepped over or around three friends who were sleeping at our side door. I gently said, good morning, and the police officer asked if I wanted them to leave, and I said, no, they can rest It was one of those moments when I realized exactly what God had called me to and when he called me to be a pastor at Atlanta First. And it was a moment when I realized exactly what God has called us to when God called us to this place. We're at the crossroads of one of the most major cities 
in the U.S., particularly in the Southeast. We're on a thoroughfare that's known the world round. They make fun of us for all our peach trees. But we sit at 360 Peachtree Street at the cusp of things I can't even yet imagine, but I know are great. And God has called us to all of the above to be in ministry with the millennials, but also to make sure that those that might otherwise get swept away are given an opportunity to hear the good news. No, no, not to hear the good news, to experience the good news. What are we going to do with the absurd amount of wealth with which we've been entrusted? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our hymn of commitment this morning is hymn number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We'll sing the first and the last verses of hymn number 400. Will you stand with me as we sing? seated for just a second. Our organ's ciphering this morning. It's always exciting. Poor Ariel's trying to get it to cut off. Nice little rumble in the, the, the change in temperature. Sometimes our organ doesn't like that. So very excited this morning to, to welcome two folks into membership at Atlanta First. Many of you know these folks very well. Uh, Jill Brown and Jeannie Spencer. Jill has been a member here before and currently is a member at Hartwell United Methodist Church. And she's coming to be an affiliate member of Atlanta First. And so um, they split time between here and the lake. And um, not a bad way to go, I don't think, um, quite frankly. And so we're welcoming Jill um, as an affiliate member. And then Jeannie, y'all know, is our interim director of the day school. She's been a part of the day school team since day one. And um, her membership's currently at uh, North Avenue Presbyterian. And so we're not going to have to go too far to transfer that down the street. And... um, but we, we welcome you both. You've both served in so many ways and have and I know will continue to do so. But this morning as you come to affiliate and to become a member of Atlanta First United Methodist Church, I simply ask you, do you promise to support our Lord and this His church with your prayers, presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, will you? We welcome as the newest members of Atlanta First United Methodist Church. Uh, thank you to all who have come and made a commitment this morning. If you weren't prepared and not had an opportunity to do so, I invite you to, um, we're going to be sending out follow-ups in the mail, and and so you'll have an opportunity to do that. And as I mentioned last week, again, for our membership, um, if you've not had an opportunity to give this year or have not um, given what you'd planned on giving, um, the next few weeks would be a great time to do that um, as we try to kind of get caught up at the end of the year and start 2015 in good shape. Why don't y'all stand with me now as we hear the, receive the benediction. Jill and Jeannie will stay with me, and I want you to come and greet them in just a moment. We've been entrusted with a lot, y'all. Um, this is a beautiful space. People come in here that are from out of town, and sometimes they walk in just to see it. And they look up, and they look around, and you can see the awe in their eyes. And, and to me, the building's beautiful, but more important to, than that are the many people who have come through this place, the many folks who have served in and through Atlanta United, First United Methodist Church. And, and we need folks to come and and to continue to do that. Not so that we can hold up a building or not that we can sustain ourselves, but so that we can continue to share with the world the good news that God came and died and rose again that we might have life and have it abundantly. So go forth in peace this morning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's family said. Will you find someone's neck to hang?